So good to see all of you out here uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to talk about suffering today. Um, and so if you're not in a position in your life where you've been suffering, thank you, Dave, um, you will be by the time this is over, trust me. No. Um, you know, I can remember, I can remember the first two times I was ever asked as a child what religion I belong to. Uh, when I, my, my family, my, my mother, my sister and I, we moved into this house uh, in a kind of densely part, uh, populated part of Nashua, New Hampshire. And uh, we're, we're in this duplex and we shared that duplex with this other family. Uh, that family had a, a, a son who was my age and my grade. And uh, we became best friends for as long as I was there. Uh, and he and his family, they were Muslim. Uh, down the road, I remember uh, a girl, uh, and, uh, and she was part of this kind of tribe that walked to school with my friend Matthew and I. Uh, her name was Ariana, and her family was Greek Orthodox. Uh, another girl in our group, her name was Jeanette, and she was, uh, she was Jehovah Witness. And then... Uh, other than that, I remember kind of hearing a lot of people say that they were Catholic. Uh, they would describe themselves as Catholic, sometimes Roman Catholic. I didn't really know anything about Catholicism necessarily, but it seemed to be um, the, kind of the predominant religion, quote unquote, that people belong to. And so the first time I was asked what religion I was, I told them I was a Christian. Like, that's what I understood myself to be. I, my grandmother uh, brought, uh, brought my sister and me to church uh, all the years kind of growing up. Um, and, uh, and so that was, that, that was a, a big part of our lives. And, and so I, uh, I, I knew I was a Christian. And I can't, tell you, I can't tell you why, but I have a recollection of a feeling that that, uh, that, that, was, that, that was weird, uh, I, I can't remember if it was because I don't really remember. I can't tell you another person that I encountered that also called themselves uh, a Christian. Uh, so I seem to be like in this massive school full of hundreds of kids. I, I, I felt like I was the only one. And so it, it created this weird feeling in me because I felt isolated as a result of, uh, you know, just, just being the only one. And then... Uh, the second time, you know, sometime, you know, down the road, I, I just remember this other time of being asked what religion I was. And when I was asked the second time, I said, uh, well, I'm Catholic. And, uh, you know, because from what I had come to know about Catholicism, it was like, it's close enough, right? Like uh, uh, we seem to believe a lot of the same things and everybody else is Catholic. This feels like a very uh, a non-threatening way to describe where I am coming from. Uh, I don't know why kids even talk about such things, but apparently, you know, that was one of the ways people were identifying themselves. And so um, the point is that we don't, we don't like being uh, left to feel isolated. We don't, we, don't, we don't enjoy the feeling of, you know, I am the only one. And because not only am I the only one, but like there's a strangeness about me compared to everybody else. Uh, you know, you've got, uh, you've got all these people. Again, I, I can't recall whether somebody did something, said something, or, or, or created this feeling in me, or if it was just something that I felt alone. But, but I do... I do remember feeling alienated uh, because of, I guess, this category that either they or I was putting myself in in comparison uh, with other people. And I don't know if you've ever experienced something like that. Uh, and sometimes perhaps you could experience that because of, you know, some religious persuasion or, you know, some particular belief system or just any other number of things that we make decisions about in our lives where, where we're left to feel like we're less than uh, because, of, because of, you know, that decision that we made. Um, sometimes it could be, just could be, have nothing to do with religion. Uh, but, you know, some choice that we've made makes us feel like we're a little isolated. I was ris listening recently to this woman uh, who, uh, she earned her PhD in economics and taught as a professor, uh, professor for a number of years at a university, and so she's telling this story. She is much older now, and she's telling the story of how 
you know, she had this ambition for her life, uh, this career that she wanted to pursue. And in her mind, the way you were supposed to go about doing that is not unlike the way most of us think you're supposed to go about doing that today. And that is, she graduated from high school and she went and she earned her undergraduate degree uh, and immediately went into graduate school, uh, ultimately earned her PhD and secured a position as a professor. And at that point where she was finally about to be tenured as a professor, it was at that point she felt like things had become stable in her life such that now it's time to raise a family, right? She's, she's gone after her plan in this, again, what is a really common pathway, uh, and, and decides now she's later on in years, um, likely in her late 30s or so, and she and her husband decide it's time to have a family. And at that point, uh, like oftentimes happens as people are aging, uh, infertility becomes often a bigger issue, and that was the case for them. And so uh, they found themselves facing this crisis of now wanting to have children, but perhaps not being able to do so. And so she's just, she's going over this in her own mind and, and, and bringing out something I never really thought of. And that is that, uh, you know, we have created this society that requires people to do things in a certain order if they're ever going to accomplish what they want. Again, for her, there was no, there's no way for her to become a professor at a university if she started a family as a young lady and put off the ambition for her career and her education and all that until later on. While now, as she is older, she's looking back and wishing she had kind of flip-flopped those things. But regretting the rules that we have created where it's really, really difficult for a person to do that because, you know, in order to keep up with society, you have to keep up with society. And so what uh, the point of that story is to say, when a person decides to do something that maybe is not considered normative, like let's say, uh, you know, a, a, a husband and wife, they decide uh, after they get married that they want to start a family early on, like they're in their early 20s. And so perhaps the decision is made that um, they're going to raise that family. And then when the children get older, then uh, the wife will go back to school and, and, and do the same thing. Like, again, just flip-flopping it. And, and a, lot of people, a lot of people would say, you yeah, can't do that. Like that's, that's not the way to do it. And so um, from her perspective, I think she was kind of sharing how she just felt the pressure to do it a certain way. And I don't know about you, but perhaps you face that uh, in your own life with some of the decisions that you've made. You know, I think about, uh, this is kind of a big issue uh, in our world today, but I think about how, uh, how reluctant people sometimes are with guarding the sanctity of their bodies. Uh, like we are uh, at an increasingly younger age ushering children into the culture and climate of sexuality you know, far before they really should even have to be responsible for either information or even um, what they're supposed to do with their own behavior. Uh, and, and, and although a lot of sexual expression happens because of our desires, right? Like people do things because they want to do things. I think sometimes there are many, many instances of people doing things that in their minds and in their spirit, they consider, you know, this is not a healthy thing for me or this is not the best choice for me right now. But they feel pressured into having to engage in that because, well, everybody else is and that's what you're supposed to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you imagine this, this, this young adult or this adolescent who uh, wants to be able to engage in uh, relationships, perhaps even romantic relationships, but without having to go to that very physical, very intimate and sexual part of what that romantic relationship has. But, but like, that's kind of, that, 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 by some that's considered as unhealthy. The idea of abstaining from sex when, um, you know, we really should be, feel free to, to uh, experience, experiment with, or engage in sex whenever, wherever, and however, um, uh, it, it creates this unnecessary pressure on 
certain people. And so when a person decides, you know, I'm not going to do that, like I, 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 I want to guard the sanctity of my body, like that person can sometimes be put in this category where they're considered like weird or less than. And the question is, is, is the good thing that that person is trying to uphold in their own lives that they have decided for themselves is good, is that worth having to suffer the, what is sometimes the ridicule, the persecution. You know, same with that family that makes a decision that they're going to start a family earlier on versus later on, which, you know, we're told that's not the way you're supposed to do it. I think about our kids in school and the pressure that they feel sometimes with, with having uh, to uh, experiment with, with, with cigarettes and vaping and alcohol and drugs and, you know, any number of these things activities that are risky behaviors, unhealthy behaviors, but when they find themselves in a group of people where the majority of those people are also doing it, sometimes it's really hard to stand up and say, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to participate that. And, and again, like make a decision to hold on to something that's good, um, even despite the relative suffering that they might experience as a result of that. Uh, what we do here in church, you know, is another area of our lives. Um, how many people, how many friends do you have? How many family members do you have that think you're crazy? Right? Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, giving up, getting up early on a Sunday morning, right? To hang out with a bunch of other weirdo fanatics that believe all kinds of strange things. You're going to listen to some guy talk for a while and sing, you know, in church, right? And so uh, when a person, like forget about just simply coming to church, but when a person engages in a faith community in a church like this, where they are loving and serving one another, they're committing their time to this thing. They're committing, uh, in many cases, some of their money to this thing. Like other people look at that and they say, because they don't understand the value of this thing that you're holding. And so sometimes there's, there's some suffering, right? There's some ridicule that comes along with that. So what do we do with that? Well, Jesus had something to say about uh, persecution. And I will say at the outset that, you know, a lot of the persecution that we read about and discover uh, in the Bible through the teaching of Jesus and through the teaching of his followers, like it's a different level of persecution. Let's be honest. It's a different level of persecution than the kind of persecution we are generally going to face in the society in which we live. I mean, we live in a, a, a fairly tolerant society where uh, you don't have to worry. Uh, first of all, you don't have to worry that, you know, because you call yourself a Christian or a Muslim or a Buddhist or anything else, you don't have to worry about being imprisoned for that. Right? You don't have to worry about somebody coming and, and, and taking your house and all your possessions away. For the most part, uh, we generally, although we could, we could make decisions uh, religiously or philosophically that might upset some of our family members, most of the time, it, it, it's, it's not creating such a rift that, that those relationships are permanently uh, scarred or hurt. So the, the, the kind of persecution we face is, you know, is often of a, a lesser type, but it is still, nonetheless, it is real, right? Because again, I get, my mind goes back to, as a child, my, my not wanting to, or, or, or disguising how I would really like to identify myself, I, I, I disguise that for fear of being isolated, of, of being considered like I was weird. I was this other person that I was, uh, you know, I was so unlike everybody else that I probably wasn't worth uh, their time. So here's what Jesus has to say about persecution in these things called the Beatitudes. This is our last one. Uh, this is the, the final pronouncement of blessing that Jesus makes. And he says this in Matthew 5 verses 10 through 12. He says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness's sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Jesus recognized that for the sake of righteousness, which we'll get into that because that's kind of a weird thing, but for the actual sake of righteousness, that is because people will want to follow in my footsteps, promoting the teaching of the kingdom of God, which is to bring God's true 
justice and mercy into this world because people will want to work to bring real justice, real righteousness into the world. As a result of that desire and as a result of those efforts, they will suffer persecution, right? Which again, that's kind of weird, but Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then on this particular one, he elaborates, He says, blessed are you. It's almost like he turns his attention now to his disciples after having pronounced all these blessings. And he says, blessed are you. Listen, like, listen to what I have to say to you. Blessed are you when? When you find yourself in a situation where others are reviling you and persecuting you, when they are uttering all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How many of you have ever, like how many of you are big time like social media buffs out there? Nobody wants to admit that, right? All right, we're, we're, you know what? Hey, we're getting somewhere here at Curtis Lake Church. Um, come on, I know you're out there. Uh, some of you spend all kinds of time on social media and you're really... You're really guarded about your presence on social media, how you're perceived and and what other people think about you. It's probably why you spend a lot of time on social media, right? Uh, And so uh, how many of you have, in the course of all your social media enterprising, uh, has somebody miscategorized something you said, something you intended to say, something you meant, Right? And that just created, you know, this, this just mad rush of, of, of misrepresentation. How many of you who ever felt like you were violated by another person's estimation of you, how many of you reacted by rejoicing? <laughs> right? How many of us have ever found ourselves in a place where uh, as, as we were made to feel less than, as we were encountering suffering, again, for some good thing, how many of us have rejoiced? This is so weird, right? I I don't know if you're catching on, but this is a really, really weird thing that Jesus is saying. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those. You're blessed when people talk badly about you. You're blessed when when you know that another person has kind of sneered their nose at you, when a person has dragged your name through the mud falsely, rejoice and be glad, Jesus says. Um, let's first of all, let's talk about what Jesus is not saying here. Jesus is not saying, blessed are those who on account of their self-righteousness are experiencing suffering. We have to be very careful not to confuse righteousness with self-righteousness. There is a very specific blessing that Jesus is uttering, and he is, not, he is not pronouncing a blessing on those who consider themselves to be better than everybody else on account of their righteousness. I say all the right things and I do all the right things and I am a good, moral, upstanding person. I know how to, you know, to, um, to act the way I'm supposed to act, to do what I'm supposed to do. And um, I mean, God couldn't do anything but love me, right? Um, love the likes of me. We read about, uh, a few weeks ago, we read about, a person who was like that, a person who came into the church of his day and just, um, he just looked up to heaven and he's like, God, thank you so much for making me like I am. Thank you so much for make, not making me like, like that guy over there, right? Um, Jesus is not pronouncing a blessing on the person who is righteous in their own mind, self-righteous. He is not, pronouncing a blessing on the person who is suffering on account of their having deserved that suffering. How many of you ever suffered because you deserved it? Right, that happens sometimes. Um, 
if you're a follower of Jesus, you might have, you might have done this kind of thing, you know, where perhaps because of your passion and zeal and love for Jesus, you've done some knuckleheaded things or said some knuckleheaded things. And as a result of that, that lack of wisdom, that lack of discretion, that lack of grace and mercy and love that we're supposed to exercise toward all people, maybe, maybe you found yourself ostracized and isolated because, you know, well, to be honest, everybody just thought you were a big pig-headed jerk. And Jesus is not saying blessed are those who, who bring on for themselves you know, a measure of vitriol that comes from the world because, because, you're, because you're being arrogant or because you're being mean or mean-spirited. He said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are those who, on account of me, he says, like through your identification with me, suffer some injustice. And so what Jesus is really saying is blessed are those who suffer for righteousness. Uh, one of Jesus' followers, Peter, some of you are familiar with Peter. Uh, Peter was an interesting character. Uh, of all those that were following Jesus, he was certainly regarded as the most impulsive. Uh, he was the loud mouth, right? He was the one... Uh, that if there was going to be any hostility, if anybody was going to threaten Jesus or Jesus' followers, Peter would be the first one to kind of jump to the front of the line to defend uh, and to fight, right? In fact, we have one story when uh, just before Jesus was brought to the cross, he was arrested. And in that uh, event of his being arrested and taken away, uh, we are told that Peter had a sword on him and he took it and he sliced off the ear of one of the, one of the servants that had come to accompany Jesus in his arrest. And Jesus yelled at him. He's like, Peter, put your sword away. This is not how we're doing this, right? So, so Peter was that kind of person, very, very impulsive. Not, not the kind of person that was willing to suffer. Uh, you know, if, if Jesus and his disciples, if they walked into a certain area of town and they were, let's say they were mistreated by the people that were there. They just weren't, they weren't welcomed. They weren't embraced. Peter would be the kind of guy that would say, hey, hey, Jesus, what do you think? Should we call down fire from heaven or what? Huh? What do you think? This, I feel like some, I feel like some fire and brimstone is an appropriate uh, punishment for these people. What do you think? Right? So that's, that's Peter. And then, so years after uh, Jesus died, rose again, and Peter's now a leader within the church. He wrote a letter, and here's what he says, and, and this is him speaking to each of us. He says, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. As if he's adopting the language of what he remembered Jesus teaching him back there on the mountain that day, when Jesus said, blessed are those who suffer for my sake. It says, if you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But, but then he says this, because he knows, he knows there's other people that are, that are sitting around that are like how he was, maybe still is a little bit. He says, but that none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. That is, like, don't be that person who is suffering, not, not really because of your identification with Christ, the real Christ, but because of you, right? Because you're the story, because you're the, you're the one that is bringing that suffering upon yourself. Jesus is talking about a persecution that comes to that person who is guilty of nothing other than being like Jesus, of striving to be like, to live like, and to love like Jesus. Acting like he does. How did Jesus act? Well, Jesus, he acted outside the boundaries of what were considered proper, normal societal behavior, right? Jesus was purported to be this great teacher, a prophet perhaps even. And yet what we, we find Jesus hanging out with, with, with drunkards and with prostitutes, 
with the, 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 the lowest of society, uh, the scum of society as they might be notoriously described. And that's not what you're supposed to do. That, those aren't the people you're supposed to be with. And yet that's exactly how we find Jesus. And as a result of that, Jesus presented a threat to those who were in power. And those who were in power were unhappy. They were unhappy with the teaching that Jesus was bringing. They were unhappy with the way Jesus was demonstrating the love of God to those they cared nothing for. And so, so, do, so should his followers follow in his footsteps doing exactly the same thing. A loving the unlovable. of showing love not just to friends and to relatives, but showing love even to enemies. There's, a, there's a, this category of behavior that, that puts you, when you're, when you're acting like and living like and loving like Jesus, it puts you at, at opposition with the world we live in. The life of the Christian, the life of the follower of Jesus will, uh, on occasion, it will create disturbances. There's a disturbance in the force, Luke, you know. You follow and walk like and act like and love like Jesus, that will on occasion create a disturbance in this world. Because that behavior and that kind of real love, it stands in opposition to a kingdom, right, and the powers of this world that are hostile toward the godly kingdom that Jesus wants to bring in. Jesus said over and over again, my kingdom is not of this world. It does not operate by the rules and the associations that this world operates and is ruled by. You know, my kingdom doesn't line up neatly and all tidy with your perception of what is the perfect government. Oh, if only the Democrats could have full control. Oh, if only the Republicans could have full control. If only our nation could become like what it was, you know, as if there was ever a time in our nation where we were truly just and righteous. The kingdom of Christ does not come by way of power. It is not through the assertion of power, either military power or the kind of power that through force compels people to follow. It, 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 is, it, is, it is otherly defined and it is otherly ushered in. And it stands in contrast with the world. It's, it's in opposition to the world's way of being and of doing. And so as you more follow in the footsteps of Jesus, the real Jesus, the Messiah, the, 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 uh, the anointed one, the one who was sent to come and to save and redeem the world, as you come in, as you love like he did, and live like he did it, you're going to find yourself standing in opposition to the power structures of our world. A student is going to find themselves in a hostile environment with their school and the power structures that rule that school. You in your workplace may find yourself uh, in a hostile environment with and among those you work because of what you believe and what you hold on to and what you cherish. Uh, within, let's say, the people that you call your friends perhaps even your family, you may from time to time find yourself at odds with even people that are really, really close to you. You know, Jesus said something really interesting. I wasn't, I wasn't planning on saying this, and um, I may get this all jumbled up, but Jesus said something really interesting. Uh, Jesus said, and, and I probably really shouldn't go into this, right, because I can't, I, I can't really bring it all together, but I feel like I, I should say, Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword, right? And Jesus said that as a result of my kingdom being brought into this world, 
they're going to be natural relationships that are going to find themselves in conflict. Like you're going to have father against child and brother against brother, sister against sister. Like we're going to, the, the, there, there's, with the coming on of Christ's kingdom, there are going to be those who don't want it. They want to live under the, the dictates and the determinations of the world system. And where, where those two things are in opposition with one another, um, there is going to be suffering. This is what we really probably ought to expect, after all. Uh, this isn't for today, uh, but shortly after this, the very next things that Jesus starts to talk about is, he says, you are the salt of the earth. And he says, you are the light of the world. And he uses the illustration of light coming and penetrating into the darkness of this world. Well, what happens when light comes into darkness, right? There's, this, there's two things that are opposed to one another. So persecution ultimately comes from, or the persecution at least that Jesus is talking about, comes from an identity with Jesus. And it comes in many forms, Right? Um, you might have experienced persecution in any number of ways. Jesus says, blessed are you when people revile you. That is, when you find people insulting you, denouncing you, verbally abusing you. Have you, ever, have you ever been verbally abused for something that you upheld as good and as right? Um, you ever found yourself, because of your association with Jesus, your desire to be in relationship with Jesus, that you were assaulted verbally? He said, blessed are you when people persecute you. Uh, so persecution literally means to pursue or to chase after. The idea is that when I am being persecuted, I am, I, I, I am, I am being chased after. I am being pursued, right, with, a, uh, with the intent of violence. He says, blessed are you when people speak of you falsely. Again, this idea of perhaps... Um, people misrepresenting your actions, your words, your thoughts, things like that. So persecution comes in many forms. <coughs> but while Jesus can, while he can be the reason for our suffering, the cause for our suffering, right? Like uh, as a child, I thought if I say I'm a Christian, people are going to think I'm weird. So that would be one way to experience suffering if it happened. I don't even, I don't even know that it really ever did. But if... Uh, as a result of my association with Jesus, um, that caused suffering. It can also be the purpose for suffering. And this is a little hard for us to relate to, again, because we, we, we suffer very little. But there are people in this world today, right now, who are undergoing tremendous persecution, like real persecution. People who are simply because they identify themselves as a follower of Jesus, as a Christian, they're being... Uh, Tortured, imprisoned, sometimes executed. Right, so that's, that's real persecution. Jesus says, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my sake. But at the same time that he can be the cause, the reason for why that person's suffering, that, suffer, that person's not suffering because they've done anything wrong. It's not because they've mistreated anybody or, 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 or violated a righteous law. Um, they might have violated a law, a law that says you're not allowed to be a Christian. You're not allowed to profess faith in Christ. Right? They might have broken that law, but they haven't broken a righteous law. So they are suffering on account of Christ, but that can also be the purpose for their suffering. Uh, Jesus, he told his disciples one time, he says, be on your guard for they, right? That is, again, the power structures of this world. And, and on the one hand, the religious uh, power structure that existed that, that oversaw every minute detail of, of uh, the, the people's lives, uh, they, and then also the secular power, the Roman power that, that through, uh, through violence and, and, uh, and policing and militants forced people to act and behave in a certain way. It says, be on your guard for they will deliver you over to councils. That is, you, you're, you're going to experience persecution. You're going to be, you're going to be imprisoned, right? And you'll be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness to them. So at the same time, you will be falsely beaten for something that isn't really wrong. That will also, at times, present itself as an opportunity for you to bear witness in the presence of governors and kings. And that's exactly what happened to these people that Jesus was talking to, these disciples that were following Jesus. 
They stood in the presence of powerful, the most powerful people in the world, people they never would have had an opportunity to engage through any other means. The suffering that they had to willingly endure also, in some cases, provide itself as an opportunity. And although we might not see it at exactly that same level, we need to see that our potential suffering can provide opportunities for us as well. Now, you might be saying, you know what, but, but, but Josh, I'm, just, I'm not suffering enough for Jesus. Anybody like that? You say, I, I, tell me, Josh, how can I suffer more for Jesus? Anybody want to sign up for that? Um, well, a lot of times we're not, we don't suffer for Jesus because we're so, we have so privatized our faith in Christ and our desire to serve him and to live like him where we're supposed to be witnesses for him. And if we were actually a little more outward with our faith, if we believed a little more that other people's lives and eternity were actually in the balance, perhaps we'd be willing to suffer um, for standing up for and identifying ourselves as followers of Jesus. And so, uh, you know, I want to encourage you, you know, to... If you haven't already decided to, I want to encourage you to come out to see this movie tonight. It's such a great movie that tells the story of somebody that endured tremendous suffering for having done nothing wrong and had to learn what it meant to not only endure that suffering, but to stare one's enemy in the face and demonstrate love and forgiveness toward that person. Why? Because evil is very, very powerful. Right? Evil is a very powerful force in our world. Let's be honest. It's, just, it's very, very powerful. But you know what's more powerful than evil? It's not, um, it's not another kind of evil that just is bigger in power. What's more powerful than evil is a willingness to suffer evil. A willingness to suffer evil is a greater power than evil itself. And so let me just leave you with three thoughts as we close out this morning. When it comes to the potential that you might experience persecution in your life, here's here's what I would propose we should do with that persecution. Number one, we must not retaliate. We must be very, very careful not to retaliate. When we find ourselves in a position where we are suffering on account of Jesus, we must not retaliate. There is no... uh, There is no violent, militaristic response appropriate for the follower of Jesus toward those who cause our suffering. We must not retaliate. Oh, I know we want to retaliate, right? Uh, One time I, I was delivering a truckload of mail to a post office, something I've done hundreds of times. Not to... I go, I go to a part of the post office you never see, um, to the loading docks. And so I go back there with, with this truckload of mail, and I present the paperwork to the person. He says, you have to bring that around front. And I said, no, it's supposed to be back here. No, you have to bring it around front. I'm like, no, I got a whole truckload of mail here. I don't drag it through the lobby. No, you have to bring it up. So we're going back and forth. I'm getting nowhere with this guy. And I'm right. I am in the right. And he's mistreating me. He is, <laughs> he, he's not... Not tre- he's, he's, he, doesn't wanna, he doesn't wanna bother with this project apparently. And so, so I go around front, I show them the paperwork and they say to me, what? Yeah, you gotta bring that around back. To which I say, yes, I know that. I tried that. So anyway, so I go back, you know, and, and, and you know, you know how it is when, when you have been justified, right? Um, I go back there and I'm strutting my stuff because I know, again, I'm in the right. And you know what I want more than anything? boy, do I want that guy to have to help me unload the truck, right? And so I'm back there, I'm unloading, right? And I am whistling and I am humming and I am just looking around like, where is that guy? I want him to see that I am in the right place doing the right thing, right? That's, we, we do that. We, we have this desire to retaliate and we have to guard ourselves against that. Secondly, we must not resent the harm that is done to us. We have to be really, really careful when we suffer on account of another person's treatment of us not to let our hearts become full of resentment toward that person or to that group of people. 
That's really, really easy to do. You know, it's one thing to, to temper our behavior. It's one thing to not retaliate, to act externally. But boy, it's a whole other thing entirely to guard our hearts from resentment. We have to be careful to act appropriately internally and not just externally. And then finally, and this is the weirdest part of it, we must, when we find ourselves persecuting for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of what is right, for the sake of bringing God's justice and mercy into our world, if we are called to suffer for doing that, we must rejoice. What? Rejoice? Yeah. He says, rejoice when others revile you. Rejoice when others speak all kinds of bad things about you falsely. Like rejoice that you have been considered worthy to suffer on account of me. And so we don't retaliate. We don't harbor resentment. And in fact, we actually go completely the other direction and we rejoice in the suffering. I know that sounds like a really impossible thing to do, but there's a reason for it. Jesus says, rejoice because, he says, because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Um, when we started this several weeks ago, we started with Jesus' first pronouncement of blessing. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We've talked about a number of things since then, and now we close out with, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for, again, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, for those who have nothing, right, the poor in spirit, those who are poor in fact, or those who are poor in their, their understanding and their estimation of themselves, they have the whole kingdom of heaven that is going to be given to them. Blessed are those who have nothing, <laughs> for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And, and here, blessed are those who have been willing to lose everything. And I wonder this morning, is there anything that you and I believe in so strongly, so passionately, is there, is there something for which we are so convicted in our hearts is right and true and good? Is there anything that you'd say, it does not matter what anybody should say about me. It does not matter what anybody should do to me. I'm going to hold firm to this. The very first and foremost thing that that ought to be is your love for and your relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't let anything get in the way of that. Don't let any power system get in the way of what it means to pursue and to grow that relationship with Jesus. Even if somebody thinks you're weird and fanatical, maybe even out of your mind, it's okay. There's a handful of other people that are right there with you. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness. Let's be about bringing the true, real righteousness of God into our world, into our homes, into our schools, into our workplaces, into wherever God gives us the opportunity to bring that righteousness, to bring that justice, to show his mercy, to show his love. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this, um, this last pronouncement of blessing uh, that we will take up in this section. And I pray that you would just implant in our hearts a desire uh, to see your righteousness promoted throughout our world, regardless of what it might cost us. Lord, if there's anybody here that finds themselves in the days or weeks to come in a position where they have to either decide to hold to what is good or perhaps endure the ridicule or the ostracization or just the, the persecution of another person or a group of people, Lord, I pray that you'd be willing or help them to be willing to stand up, that, that you would give, you would grant them the grace and the power. Lord, I, I think of those who find themselves, especially in those really vulnerable places, uh, our kids at school, where sometimes it's, it's just hard. It's hard to, to hold on to what you know is true and right. It's hard to... Be willing to just be open with the fact that we believe that you
you are the son of God, that you died on the cross and you rose from the dead. We believe some crazy things, but Lord, I pray that we'd be far more in love with you and pursuing a relationship with you than we would worry about the suffering that might come as a result of that identification. Lord, help us more than we ever have before. Help us to just walk more like you walk, to live like you live, and to love like you love.